So I was so grateful that David said that he would be able to go over to Afghanistan and a number of people who have been part of peace teams and other contexts have gathered together. And for me, it was my fourth trip over to Afghanistan since May of 2009. And one of the things that kind of prompted the group I'm with, Voices for Creative Nonviolence, to be thinking about that part of the world was a visit from Jeremy Scahill, the author of the book uh, Blackwater. Jeremy's a fine researcher and a very energized uh, peace activist as well. And he was visiting us, and in our kitchen, he started pounding the kitchen table and asking me, Kathy, when are you going to get in touch with the 21st century military? And I'm like, I have no idea what he was talking about. So after he left, I started Googling around. And, and, and it was at that point that we began to be much more aware of the usage of the predator drones and the reaper drones, these unmanned or unpersoned aerial vehicles, which are launched from places like Creek Air Force Base in Nevada or Syracuse, so John Hancock Field in Syracuse, and are being used to attack when they're outfitted with uh, Hellfire missiles and 500 pound bombs to attack people, including civilian people, in Pakistan and in Afghanistan. So a number of us had gone over to Pakistan in 2009. And I would just like to tell you briefly an experience from that time. We couldn't go into North or South Waziristan. Those areas are completely hands-off. Seasoned journalists can't go in there either. And so we had worked through a, a center in Rawalpindi, Pakistan, where people said, well, yeah, we can bring some people to talk to you about their experiences as survivors of drone warfare. And so it was through that um, connection that a man came to talk to us, and he said he would prefer not to give us his real name. And he began to tell us about his experience living in Kaisor, a village with 500 people, so small that there's not even a road that leads up to the village. And he said that it happened one day that some strangers came to the village and from time immemorial, the obligation, the legal code, the indisputable responsibility of the village elders is that if somebody comes and knocks at your door and is seeking hospitality, there's no discussion, you give it. It's not like you can say, well, the 7-Eleven is that way or Motel 6 is over there. Uh, people could die if you don't extend that hospitality. So strangers had come. They were welcomed inside the home of the village elder. They shared a meal. They were given beverage, water, or something to drink. The strangers were long gone. At 4.30 in the morning, hellfire missiles were fired into the home that gave them that hospitality. And we could only guess that somehow those strangers had appeared on the grainy screen of people in the Air Force base, or maybe the CIA base in Langley, and had been identified as HVTs high-value targets. And at that point, they're followed very, very closely by people viewing camera screens and also in touch with a kill chain. And the decision has to be made somewhere, are these high-value target Taliban or not? And if it's decided that these are, in fact, Taliban, then the decision can be made to hit, uh, it's described as impact, and the people that are involved in the killing of base people are here in the United States. They've never left the base here. And so after this man described having been in the village when this happened and it helped us see that, you know, this is a village with no roads even leading up to it, we, we asked questions, well, what do you do in the aftermath? You don't have emergency medical technicians, you don't have some way to get the survivors to some kind of hospital facility. And he said, uh, yes, madam, you see what we do. We take the tabutta. I was wearing one of those long scarves myself. And he said, they wrap it around as many times as they can to try to stanch the bleeding. And they put the survivors on their shoulders. And then they try to make their way to the road where there would be possibly a vehicle that they could hail. And, and he, he, he told us that when they finally did stop a vehicle, the driver heard the story of what had happened and sped away as fast as he could because he knew that the drone might still be hovering and he didn't want to be the next one in the crosshairs. And then the man said that people do send text messages. They have cell phones all through the network of villages. And they send the message, this bloody thing has happened again. 
And so I asked him, well, can you at all imagine that if Westerners, US people, poor civilians were to come to your village in Kaisora and talk to people about what happened, that the villagers would ever talk with us? And the man looked at me like I was off my rocker. And he said, of course we would sit down to talk with you. Who would be so crazy as to not to want the peace? Just, you must leave your weapons behind. Who would be so crazy as to not to want the peace? And this seems to be something that we heard echoed from different communities, different perspectives, all throughout our time in Afghanistan. And I can imagine many others in Pakistan hold that same view, that people want the peace, but just you must leave your weapons behind. Well, our weapons are pretty estimable. There's a, a, a Pakistani journalist who wrote that hunger and anger combined are like two live wires. You touch them together, there can be an incandescent explosion, a flash that maybe can't be controlled. And that to me is the very emblematic, that description of much of what I've seen in Afghanistan. Um, with good reason, intense, intense anger combined with hunger. And one of the places where that's most visible in my mind is a, a refugee camp called the Charihi Kambar refugee camp inside of Kabul. And when we went there, uh, the kids went to get the village elders right away. Well, the village elders are half my age, but the life expectancy in Afghanistan is 44 years of age. So it's a very young country. When people are 25, 26 years old, their lives are more than half over. So the village elders, these younger men, came, and one of them, his eyes kind of narrowed when he saw me, and he flipped a very decrepit blanket that was over the mud hut, which was typical of all of the dwellings in this area where 1,000 families now live. And people have come there, certainly not by choice, but because they've been forced off their land by warfare. And when he flipped the blanket, it immediately ripped. There was a puff of dust, and the blanket was so old and useless, it ripped. And he asked me, do you think that we like to live this way? And I was looking around a camp that was um, completely constructed of mud. The children looked, many of them, malnourished, and several had respiratory infections. Do you think we want this for our children, he asked. The air was very accurate already. Kabul has the most fecal content in its air quality of any place in the world. And these folks had no fuel. They didn't have logs or twigs to burn, so they burned garbage. So the air was very, very bad. And then he took us a little further into the camp, and a man reached into his pocket, and he just pulled out two crumpled photos. They were pictures of two of his children who were among his five children who had all been killed by a United States drone attack, along with his wife. And the children's bodies were covered with blood and were mangled. And so these families, there were four brothers, they couldn't wait around to see, is this going to happen again? So they picked up everything they had. They were goat herders. They didn't have much. And they left their goats behind, and presumably that's their livelihood. I don't know that anybody could have fed or watered the goats, so they've got nothing to go back to. And they came into Kabul sort of at the mercies of where the Kabul government might put the refugees. And one big military fellow owned land, which he gave over for refugees to stay in, but he said, I don't want any latrines dug on my land, and I don't want any wells dug. So there was one well for many, many, many families and no latrines. So you can imagine what a prescription for disaster this can be. And we were taken further into the camp, and it was cold, and I kind of huddled next to a little girl when I went inside one of the huts. And then her uncle came over and he, he unzipped her jacket ever so slightly and showed me that the drone attack had cut off this girl's arm. And next to her was her brother. And people later said they were pretty sure he was a heroin addict. And he was in so much pain, his leg had been mangled and they'd never gotten proper medical care. Well, when you look across the road from the Charahi Kambar refugee camp, as far as the eye can see, there's a very well-constructed wall to a United States military base. And inside that base, there's a big stretch for tanks to practice driving along, and there's a big ammo dump, and it's a base that, of course, is being serviced by 
a long line of trucks. Every day the trucks drive right past the desperation and the squalor and the neediness of the impoverished Chariyikamba refugee camp and the trucks carrying food and fuel and water go into the U.S. base. 7,000 trucks every day cross in through Pakistan, maybe across the Quetta border or up further across the Khyber Pass, and they carry goods and supplies to the United States military. Now, each one of those trucks is basically taxed. Warlords control the roads. And the warlords are no fools. They say to the United States, if you want your trucks to pass on our roads, that'll be $1,000 per day per truck, thank you. And if the U.S. doesn't pay, every now and then you see those stories about how a bunch of trucks were torched while they were parked in a parking lot waiting to go into Afghanistan. That's the price that will be paid. So the United States empties up. The government of the United States, the U.S. military, pays every single day $1,000 per truck for 7,000 trucks to deliver goods and supplies to the U.S. Army. Every single U.S. military person in Afghanistan, according to Congressional Research Information Service statistics, cost the United States taxpayer over the course of one year $1 million. So think about it. We're spending $2 billion per week to maintain the United States presence in Afghanistan. And yet, 850 Afghan children die every day. 850 children die every day. Start to do the math. At the end of a week, how many children, how many mothers have carried the bundles of their children to the graveyards? One out of every five children that survives doesn't live beyond the age of five. We're talking about a country that the United Nations has said is the most dangerous and wretched country in the world into which a child can be born. The worst country in the world. And the rate of mothers who die in childbirth is higher than anywhere else in the world. When the United States first invaded, they were the third highest for deaths of mothers in childbirth. Now they're number one. 850 children dying per day. Two billion dollars being spent to maintain the United States forces. Why? Why is the United States there? What has been accomplished over 10 years of time? We went to visit the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers in their home in Bamyan in the Central Highlands. And the mothers said, we need everything. They get electricity for two hours a day between one and three in the morning. And this is after the United States has been occupying for 10 years. And this is one of the areas where there isn't a lot of combat going on. And so it would be possible to at least help people get electricity. But that doesn't seem to be so much a part of the agenda. It doesn't seem to be what the United States particularly wants to do within Afghanistan, or you wouldn't have such high rates of misery and impoverishment and death. So we looked at China. You know, Afghanistan shares a border with um, Iran and, pa sorry, and Pakistan also shares a border with Iran, and Pakistan shares a border with China. And is it possible that as the United States looks at the fossil fuels and the natural gas in the Caspian Sea Basin, and looks at the natural gas that Iran produces, and sees how that energy source could be available to China, and China is definitely our economic competitor, plus we're in debt to China, up to our ears, and you might even say we're in a cold war with China, is it possible that the United States is basically trying to establish a means to assure that China wouldn't have cheaper access to energy resources than the United States would have, and that that's the good reason to keep bases all across Afghanistan connected by roadways? Well, in November of 2010, NATO held a meeting November 19th in Lisbon. And the people emerging from that meeting were all smiles. It was all signals, go, thumbs up. The Asia Development Bank had signed on the dotted line to bankroll the Tapi pipeline. This is a pipeline that would go from Turkmenistan through Afghanistan, through Pakistan, to India. 
And the Tapi pipeline formation means that the United States would have control over the pricing and the flow of precious and irreplaceable fossil fuel and natural gas resources. And this would make a difference in U.S. relationships to China. And so why does the United States want to have bases that are connected by roadways? People will tell us that this is to defend the human rights of people in Afghanistan against the Taliban. You won't hear me saying that people are in any kind of a safe relationship to Taliban fighters who some of them, some of them, uh, adhere to a very purist, fundamentalist ideology. I think that there are vast numbers of people who are jeopardized and in danger because of that. But I don't for a moment think that the United States is deploying troops to Afghanistan because they're so concerned about the human rights of people in Afghanistan. Hunger and anger combined together. The anger of university students in Bamiyan. Uh, these were people who are almost angry at the young Afghan youth peace volunteers because they can't imagine a time of nonviolence prevailing ever. And one of the young engineers said to me, do Americans care more about noses than fingers? And I was out, I looked at him kind of bewildered. I, did, I honestly didn't know what he was talking about. And he held up a cover of Time magazine that showed the face of young Aisha, the girl whose family members, the males in her family, had mutilated her nose as a punishment because they said she violated the moral codes that the family adhered to. And so the Time magazine editors gave a subheading that said, this is why we must stay in Afghanistan. Well, this young student is asking me, do Americans care more about noses than fingers? And when I got back to New York City, I opened up the New York Times, and all of a sudden it dawned on me. I realized what the student was talking about. You probably know that the striker brigades out in Washington state were being brought before military tribunals and court marshals. And these striker brigades who do the urban combat, they have these huge vehicles with mine-resistant armor, and they go right into the situations where there might be combat and urban riot scenes, and they're trained to handle that. Well, these guys had come from duty in Iraq. And some of them were on their second and third deployments. And one, Staff Sergeant Calvin Gibbs, had boasted to the other people in his squadron that he knew how to get around the rules of war, that you could kill civilians and get away with it if you just followed the prescriptions that he had for doing so. And so he built up a small group of people who joined him in executing civilians. And they would pick somebody out, and then they could uh, work it out so they could lay a gun on the person's corpse and make it look like the person was trying to launch an attack. But in truth, these were civilians, and they all knew it. And they got kind of an adrenaline rush, a surge, on being part of the kill team. And they were accused later of being part of a three-month killing spree, which got so exacerbated that they also, as part of their esprit de corps, cut off the body parts of their victims and store them in jars and hide them in places that later became evident through testimony. And this is what the engineering student in Afghanistan knew about, that I, the peace activist, was clueless about. And so he was so angry. Do Americans care more about noses than fingers? And it's a ghastly question, but it's a question we have to look in the mirror and address. Because how are we seen? You know, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King urged the people that heard him speak out against the Vietnam War. He begged them, try to see yourselves as you're seen by your opponents. And try to see the humanity within those that you're being told are your enemy. And I think when we look for that humanity amongst people in Afghanistan, we see a country where 65% of the people are under 25 years of age. We can see young groups of people who say they don't want to continue the spirals of revenge. We can see people who are asking the United States to pay attention to the 29 NGOs that banded together and said, stop the death raids, stop the night raids, stop the death squads, stop the assassinations. Stop sending out your people in military guard posing as humanitarian workers because it makes all of us uh, less able to do the humanitarian work we're here to do. 
And they, they actually gave us an embargoed copy of their report, these 29 NGOs, thinking this is really going to hit the newspapers. It'll be front page headlines because we're delivering it during the NATO conference that I just had mentioned. You cannot find one word about it. Because in the mainstream media, those conclusions, those challenges aren't news. And when President Obama delivered his December review, there was not one word of 850 children dying every day. In his evaluation of progress, there wasn't one word about the suffering and the misery that people are experiencing in that land every day. Instead, we're being told, hang in there, bankroll another year, we're getting closer to our goals, we're making progress. Even the national intelligence estimates, two different estimates, said to President Obama, well, quite honestly, there is no evidence of progress in terms of fighting the Taliban. We can't establish that there are diminishing numbers of people joining the Taliban or that the Taliban is less able to wage war. And so now we're beginning to see the United States perhaps cutting deals with various Taliban groups. The question seems always to be from the United States side, what does the United States want for Afghanistan? I would submit that's an obscene question. It's a wrongful question. It's an unkind and a cruel question after 30 years of warfare, after the United States has spent so much money building up Pakistan's military, insisting that Afghanistan relate to the United States on a military basis. The question should be, what do people in Afghanistan want for Afghanistan? And what kind of reparations should be required of our country? Because we so wrongfully invaded that land and occupied it, we have imposed suffering on people who meant us no harm in a war that we've, by and large, forgotten. I think that one of the reasons we can be so forgetful is because we don't feel the sorrow of warfare. And there are many reasons, perhaps, why we don't feel that sorrow. I think about these youngsters I met in the Emergency Surgical Center for Victims of War, little Abidullah, who was too depressed to go outside and sit on the green grass on a sheet with some of the other kids and laugh and play, because he'd lost three fingers in his eye, and he was just trying to get accustomed to the idea that he'd never be able to use his hand again, that he'd never replace that eye. I think of Saifullah, who drove for the U.S. Army for three years, and his luck held out until the truck he was in went over an, explode, an improvised explosive device, and it went up in the air, came back down, and he lost both of his legs and had severe injuries to his back. I think about this little cartoon kid, Esmatullah, and the physical therapist patted him on the head and said, oh, he's a real cartoon. He's never cried through all of these changes of dressings. He's never cried, and this child was just beaming. He was so proud. And so these wonderful children that we meet in the hospitals who are bearing the brunt of war, they, they know the sorrow of warfare. But in many ways, it's something that is so distant, so far away from us. And um, I'd like to close. Thank you for your wonderful attentiveness while I'm on this rant, I suppose. But